religion of Islam emphasizes the stage of death. The more you remember death, the better you are prepared for this stage. For many people, death is an unpleasant topic. It's not something I'd like to think about. It's not something I would like to discuss or enjoy discussing. Because death for me is a, is a it's an uncertain reality that awaits me. I don't know if I'm prepared for it. For me, death represents the end of my joys. It causes separation between me and my loved ones. And therefore, many of us are intimidated by the topic of death. But the religion of Islam beautifully teaches us that death is like graduation. If you're in high school or you're in college and you'd like to graduate, now this, this year, due to COVID-19, there were no formal graduations. In your neighborhoods, you probably heard cars honking around, causing commotion. And initially you did not know what that is. You know, what's wrong with these people? Why are they causing all this commotion in the neighborhood? Then you come out and say, oh, it's a graduation. When you're in college and you're about to graduate, or you're in high school and you want to graduate, you look forward to your graduation, right? Because that graduation represents the end of this stage in your life and a new beginning. For the one who's serious, for the one who's prepared well, that day of graduation is a day you look forward to. Death is graduation. You graduate from this life and you embrace the new life. The reason why we abhor this graduation, the reason why we detest it, the reason why we don't look forward to it is because we're not prepared. Imagine if you have a student in high school or in college, he or she is not prepared. They've uh, flunked their courses. They have a shameful GPA. They were not serious. The day of graduation, when they think of graduation, it causes, it causes them anxiety and unease. Why? If you'd ask this person why, graduation is something we celebrate for. It's something that's pleasant. It's a day of joy. Your family comes, they congratulate you. That person will tell you, yes, I do know that, but I'm not prepared. I'm not graduating, I failed. I have nothing to celebrate for. In fact, that day of graduation um, is a day that I abhor, that I detest. I loathe that day. I do not look forward to it. The least bit, I do not look forward to it. Death is like graduation. If you are prepared, you look forward to it. You embrace the full mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he would say, that I swear by Allah, the son of Abu Talib, meaning himself, he yearns for death more than an infant that yearns to be nursed by his mother. Have you seen an infant crying from hunger? Nothing gives that infant peace other than his mother embracing him and nursing him. The Imam says, that's how I view death. And that's why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, when he was struck in the mosque of Kufa, what is the first thing that he said? Fustu wa Rabbil Ka'ba. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, I've achieved victory. That means I've graduated. That's another word for graduation. I have successfully graduated. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, we must strive more to think of death to prepare for death. Doing so will make death something that's pleasant for us. It's not something that we try to avoid all of our lives. We don't think about it. We don't prepare for it. And there will be one day when the time will come. May Allah grant you all a long and prosperous life. But one day our time will expire. That will be a bitter moment for us if we're not prepared. Now death has multiple dimensions. 
One dimension is the experience of death itself, the separation of the soul from the body, the moment of ihtidhar, as our narrations call it. Ihtidhar means presence, the presence of death, the presence of angels at the moment of death. For the evildoers, the presence of demons and devils at the moment of death. That in itself is a separate discussion. In our discussion this evening, we will examine the grave. One of the stages that await us after death is the stage of the grave. It's a very important stage, my dear brothers and sisters. After we depart this life and the soul separates from the body, we have a, a number of narrations in Shia sources and in, in Sunni sources as well that tell us the first thing that happens once the soul is separated from the body, the angels, if the person is a believer, the angels will descend upon this person and they will bring a kefen, a shroud from paradise. They will bring this heavenly kefen and wrap it around the soul and then they will ascend with the soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not physically present at the throne because Allah is not a physical entity. But the grand mercy and glory of Allah is experienced at the center of the universe which is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith states that as the angels are ascending, carrying the soul of this person, the inhabitants of the heavens, the other angels, they ask them, what are you carrying? We feel this aroma. You're carrying something that is very pleasant. They tell them we are carrying the soul of the believer. See how aromatic the soul of a believer is, such that it fills the heavens with a beautiful scent, with a good scent. That's the honor that Allah gives to the believers. Then they take it to the seventh heaven and then after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the angels to take him back to the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, I've created the humans from the earth and they must go back into the earth. So take the soul to the grave now. And that's when this stage begins. After we die, the soul is separated from the body. However, once we are placed in our grave, the soul is attached to a similar looking body. That body resembles this physical body that we have now. It resembles it. It's very similar to it. But nonetheless, the soul does attach to a barzakhi body. It's much thinner than this body. It has different attributes, different characteristics, different dimensions, but it's very similar at the same time. I would like to share with you a few hadiths that confirm this point. What is the evidence that the soul is going to attach to a body that resembles this body? We have a hadith here from the Imam السلام, in which he states, فَإِذَا قَبَضَهُ الله when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put that soul in a form that resembles your form in this world. Therefore, in the stage of the grave and the barzakh, you can eat, you can drink through this barzakhi body. فَإِذَا قَدِمَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقَادِمْ عَرِفُوهُ بِتِلْكَ الصُّورَةَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ فِي الدُّنْيَا When other deceased souls, people, will see you, they will recognize you. Oh, I know this person from the dunya. Because that barzakhi body will look like this worldly body. So it has different characteristics, but it will still be attached to the soul. So don't think that the soul is just going to float or, you know, hover, but it is going to be attached to another barzakhi body. 
Now at the time of the Imams, peace be upon them, there were some Muslim schools of thought, not from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, who claimed that when the believers die, their souls will be contained in the stomachs of birds and those birds circulate around the throne. And Imam al-Sadiq was asked about this theory. The Imam said that's preposterous, that's ridiculous. Allah will put the soul of a believer in the stomach of a bird? What kind of nonsense is that? Allah has honored the human being, the believer. He's not going to do that to him. So the Imam السلام, at the end of that hadith, he says, لَكِنْ فِي أَبْدَانٍ كَأَبْدَانِهِمْ No, Allah will put the soul in bodies like their worldly bodies. So it's not the worldly body itself because it decomposes, but the soul is put in a similar body. That's what happens in the grave. Now the stage of the grave is a very difficult stage. We have many narrations that point out the severity of this stage, the loneliness that one experiences in this stage. Therefore, it is recommended in Islamic law, when a person is about to be buried, you know, we have the tashi' where the people walk in the funeral, we take the body to the grave. The hadith states, don't rush into burying this person. When you're carrying the casket, the janazah, put it down. Wait a few moments. Take a few steps, then put it down again. Take a few steps, then put it down again. And then finally put the person in the grave. Why? Because the soul is observing here. This is a new destination. The soul is going through a lot of anxiety because oftentimes we're not that prepared. And you look at your final destination, I'm departing this world for this small hole under the ground. It's a difficult experience. So the hadith says, prepare the dead person. Don't just rush into burying them in the grave. Take a few steps, put them down, let them get it ready for it. Let them get used to this process. Because, you know, the, the, the soul is in shock, it's observing. Give the soul some time to absorb what's going on before you actually bury the body. This is recommended in Islamic law. One of the challenges of the grave, my dear brothers and sisters, is al-wahsha. The Imams of Ahl al-Bayt would cry for this stage. Just last month in the month of Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters, you read Dua Abu Hamza Thamali. Al Imam Zain al Abidin would cry for the stage. Abki Lidulmati Qabri, Lidiki Lahdi, Liwahshati. We have many narrations from the Ahlul Bayt that the Imams would cry for the darkness of the grave, the tightness of the grave, the loneliness of the grave. Many of us because we're not so prepared for the grave, it is a lonely experience for us. Here are some hadiths from the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, that do talk about that. So in this hadith, Imam Sadiq salam states, Inna lil qabri kalaman fi kulli yawm. The grave speaks every day, but of course we cannot hear it. The Imam says, the grave sends you a message every day. Ana baytul ghurba. I am the house of loneliness. Ghurba in Arabic is when you go to a place and you feel like a stranger. You don't feel comfortable. It's a new place, a strange place. Ana baytul ghurba. Ana baytul wahsha. I am the house of loneliness. Ana baytul dood. Ana ana al qabr. I am the grave. I am either a part of paradise or I am a pit of hellfire. Another hadith from Imam al-Baqir tells us what kind of acts we can do in order to alleviate the loneliness of the grave. 
The Imam السلام, states, من أتم ركوعه لم تدخله وحشة في قبره. If you pray properly and your ruku' is proper, you show submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will protect you from the loneliness of the grave. Have you seen some people when they pray, they're rushing throughout their prayer? When it comes to the ruku', they don't offer a proper ruku'. The minute you bow, Subhana Rabbi al azim wa bihamdi, you say it so fast, you don't fix yourself and stabilize your body while in ruku'. Have you seen some people? That's how they do ruku. Allah Akbar, Subhana Rabbi al azim wa bihamdi. And then, like a spring, they go back up. Man atamma ruku'ah. Respect your prayer, your salah. The effect of that is that Allah will give you company in the grave. You will not experience wahshat al qabr. Then the Imam السلام, states also, if you say this 100 times, لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين. There is no God but Allah, the King, the one who commands the truth. Allah is the truth and He shows the truth. If you say this 100 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from the loneliness of the grave. Another act that protects us from the loneliness of the grave is to visit the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, specifically Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Every time that you visit the Imams, they will pay you back that visit in the grave. And imagine if you're in your grave and you're visited by one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imagine the light, the nur that will enter your grave. Imagine the company that the Imams will give, will give you. This is a promise from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that if you follow us, you honor us, you carry our wilaya and you visit our graves, in the grave we will visit you back. In the grave we will give you company, we will give you comfort. Good deeds give us comfort in our graves and these are just a few of them. It's also highly recommended to ask Allah to protect you from wahshat al-qabr, wahshat al-qabr, the loneliness of the grave. Is that a prayer that you make? There's many prayers that we make. Oh Allah, grant me this job, land me this opportunity, give me this much money, give me the success to marry this person. There are many things that we pray for. But how often do you pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from the loneliness of the grave. This is something that you, you should pray for. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt would pray for that. Let's learn from them. One of the du'as of the Imam السلام, he would say, Allahumma barikli fil mawt. Oh Allah, bless the death for me. Allahumma a'inni ala sakarat al mawt. Oh Allah, help me when I am going through the difficulty of death. Allahumma anni ala gham al qabr. Oh Allah, help me with the sorrow of the grave. Allahumma anni ala deeq al qabr. Oh Allah, help me with the tightness of the grave. Allahumma anni ala wahshat al qabr. Oh Allah, help me with the loneliness of the grave. Make this prayer, brothers and sisters. Allah has promised if you pray, I answer your prayer. Wa qala rabbukum ud'uni astajib lakum. Allah in the Quran says, your Lord has said, pray to me. He's pronounced, he's declared, pray to me and I will answer you. And when you make such prayers, my dear brothers and sisters, you become a better person. If you just made this prayer, you're less likely to sin. That day is a better day. You feel closer to Allah, to the acts of worship, to the Holy Quran. You feel closer to your parents. Prayer is not just an utterance lip service that you do and that's it. No, prayer has an impact if you mean it. If you allow your heart to make the dua, I'm not asking you just to utter it on your mouth, but mean it from your heart. When you say it from your heart, that positively changes your life. So once we are put in the grave, the questioning of the grave starts. The interrogation of the grave starts. According to the school of Ahlul Bayt and the ahadith of Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq Who are those people who are questioned in the grave? 
The Imam السلام, says there are three categories of people in the grave. The first category are those who mahadha al-imana mahadhan. They died with full iman, full faith. Their belief in the oneness of Allah, their belief in the pillars of religion. These people who die with full iman, with full faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will dispatch the angels to question them in the grave. That's the first category. The second category, man mahadha al-kufra mahadha. Those who died with full disbelief. There is no faith in their heart. Full rejection of the signs of God. Full rejection of faith. No belief in God. No belief in any religion that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No belief in prophets. There is no faith whatsoever. These people will also be questioned. Then who is the third category? Those in between. Those people who did not have full faith, but they did not reject faith stubbornly. But most people probably fall in this category. What happens to these people who did not fully follow the right path, but they were not stubborn rejecters of the path either? They didn't know any better, or they had some belief here, but then in some other areas they had no faith. These people, the Imam السلام, says, they will be put to sleep. Once they're put in the grave, there's no interrogation for them. They will be put to sleep until the day of judgment. Once the trumpet is blown into and everyone rises from their graves, they rise and Allah passes the judgment on the day of judgment. So in reality, they don't experience barzakh. They're put to sleep, they really don't have a sense of awareness of what happens. So these are the three categories of people in the grave. So now let's talk about the interrogation of the grave. For those who are believers or those who are disbelievers, what happens in this stage? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispatches angels to address us. You will find that the most common name mentioned in hadith about these angels is Nakir and Munkar or Nakir and Nakir. Nakir and Munkar, this, these names come from the root word in Arabic that means unpleasant or rejection. When you reject something, you are considered a Munkir, right? If you reject in Arabic something, you are considered a Munkir. Or if something is unpleasant, something is terrible, something is bad, Something is a vice, we call it a munkar. So the common idea here is that munkar and nakir comes from a word that means rejection or unpleasant. Why? One hadith or one scholarly analysis tells us that the reason why nakir and munkar are called such is because the disbeliever will reject God and the path of God when he will be asked about it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the disbeliever through these angels, who is your Lord? Do you believe in the Quran? Do you believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? He will reject. And so these angels are called such because he will reject that and as a result they will punish him. Or they're called unpleasant because for the disbeliever, for those who pass their test, they are indeed unpleasant. We have narrations that graphically illustrate to us how they look, what kind of voices they generate. It's, it's not a pleasant experience, let's just leave it at that. But we have other narrations that tell us for the mu'min, for the one who passed his test, these angels are called Bashir and Mubashir. Bashir and Mubashir means someone who's pleasant, someone who has a good attitude, and someone who gives you good news. So for the believers, those angels who will interrogate them, their name is called Bashir and Mubashir. And for the unbelievers, or those who did not pass their test, they are called Nakir and Munkar. We also have the name of another angel 
Fatan al qabr the interrogator of the grave. His name is Ruman. In one dua, Al Imam Zain al Abidin mentions Roman. There are Sunni hadiths that also mention this angel. One of those hadith states Roman comes to the person in the grave and he tells him, Okay, now you have to write and document all of your deeds. Write your deeds. The person will say, How? How do I write the deeds? I don't have paper here, I don't have ink. Roman tells him, Use your kafan. Your kathan will be turned into paper, your finger will be a pen, and you can use your saliva, of course that barzakhi body, not this physical body, and that will be turned into ink. So the hadith states that the person will write his deeds until he comes to his sins. He stops. The angels ask him, why did you stop? You forgot? If you forgot, we will remind you what you did on so and so day. The person will say, no, I did not forget, but I am ashamed of writing it. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed to write what I did in the world. They tell him, subhanallah, when you were on the face of the planet and Allah was watching you, you were not ashamed to commit that sin. Now that you're six feet under, you're ashamed to write it? No, you have to write it. And then they're about to punish him, the hadith states. He says, okay, okay, let me write my good deeds now. They say, okay, write your good deeds. We'll give you an opportunity to do that. And so the good deeds will protect him. So we have the names of Munkar and Nakir, Mubashir and Bashir. And we have the name of one of those angels called Ruman, who will interrogate us during the grave. What are we asked about, brothers and sisters? We have a number of hadiths that these are the primary questions you will be asked about in your grave. Number one, who's your Lord? Who did you worship? Did you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator, or did you reject God? Or did you ascribe partners to Allah? So that's the first question. How was your relationship with God? Did you care about God and His laws? Or you cared about money more? You cared about your business more? You cared about your sports more? You cared about entertainment and gaming more? Who was more important to you in your life? God or your activities? Or your phone notifications? Or your social media? We will be asked about that in the grave. That's number one. Number two, what's your religion? What did you follow? Number three, what's your book? Which book did you recognize as a scripture from Allah? Number four, you will be asked about your prophet. Which prophet did you follow? Interestingly, in one hadith, let's say you say my prophet is Prophet Muhammad according to that hadith. The person was asked, who's your prophet? He said, Prophet Muhammad. Then the, the angel will come up with a follow-up question. Okay, Prophet Muhammad, what's your proof? Why did you follow him? Based on what proof? This hadith is very interesting and at the same time, it's an eye-opener for us, my dear brothers and sisters, because this hadith is teaching us, don't just follow blindly, have evidence. If today I ask you as a Muslim, you believe in the Prophet Muhammad what's your evidence that he was really a prophet? How can you prove that he was a prophet? What are the miracles that you can witness today that demonstrates to you he was connected to Allah and that the Quran is from Allah? Now, probably according to this hadith, your answer can be brief. You don't have to go you know, into, into detail, but the point is the angels will ask you. Why do you believe in Prophet Muhammad? You should have the answer. You should back up your answer with evidence. And that should urge us and encourage us to find out the reason behind our belief system. Know why Allah exists, why He's just, why He sent prophets, why the Quran is the word of God, why there is a day of judgment. My dear brothers and sisters, be in a position where if someone asks you, you can articulate your answer. Know why you believe in these 
belief systems. Because Allah will question you in the grave. Why did you? Okay, Prophet Muhammad, that, that's the correct answer. But why? Prove it to me. How do you know the Prophet was a Prophet? Our faith must be well grounded. We must be able to justify our faith and to substantiate what we believe in and to back it up with evidence. Amongst the other questions that we will be asked about our prayer, our salah, our fasting, our zakat. Zakat is the financial responsibilities. Whether it's the zakat that you pay on the crops or gold, currency, or it's the khums that you have to pay, or it's the kafara that you have to pay, or zakat al-fitra, all of this falls under the category of zakat. Allah will ask you about the zakat. And the hajj, Allah will ask you about the hajj. Through these angels, you will be asked about the hajj. You will be asked about your life, how did you spend it? How do I spend my life? You will be asked about the money, from which source did you make it? Was it from a halal source or a haram source? Was it a source that was based on injustice, exploitation of others, interest, alcohol, haram advertising? Was it based on that or was it based on a legitimate source? You will be asked about that. And the Imam says, you will also be asked about our wilaya, the Ahlul Bayt. And it's the most important thing we will be asked about. Wilaya, my dear brothers and sisters, the belief in the Imams of Ahlul Bayt is a completion of prophethood. Prophet Muhammad is the last of prophets. But who protects the message after him? That's the role of wilaya. Wilaya means I seek a pure source that shows me the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Because after the Prophet, the sunnah was changed. That's the reality. Bani Umayyah destroyed the sunnah of the Prophet. Many fabricators emerged. How can I trust that I have a pure source that explains to me the sunnah of the Prophet and the Holy Quran? That's the Ahlul Bayt. We will be asked about the Wilaya. Did I honor the teachings of Ahlul Bayt? Did I uphold their message? And that's the role of deeds, my dear brothers and sisters. The deeds will protect us in the grave. The Salah will turn into a shield that protects you from any danger. Zakat will turn into a shield that will protect you from any danger. Honesty, integrity, truth all of those good deeds will be a shield that will protect you in the grave. So these are some of the very important questions that we will be asked in the grave. Now we will end with this discussion, my dear brothers and sisters. Do we have evidence from the Quran that there is the punishment of the grave? There are some Muslim schools of thought, such as the historically the Ash'aris, they denied that there is punishment in the grave. That's it, you die, you're put into the grave and you, put, you are put to sleep until the day of judgment. The punishment is on the day of judgment. There's no punishment in the barzakh. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we believe no. For, for some people, there will be punishment in the grave. Do we have evidence in the Quran that there is definitely Punishment in the grave. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters. If you go to Surah Ghafir, verses 45 and 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Fir'aun and his people who died on the evil path and they rejected the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, فَوَقَاهُ اللَّهُ سَيِّعَاتِ مَا مَكَرُوا وَحَاقَ بِآلِ فِرْعَوْنَ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrounded the people of Fir'aun with punishment. Fire, they are exposed to it day and night. Okay, one is this, this is before the day of judgment. Because the Quran says, And then when the hour comes, the day of judgment, Allah will say, take the people of Fir'aun to a severe punishment. So that means now before the day of judgment, day and night, they are exposed to the fire. That's the world of the grave. 
Because the grave, as the hadith states, either transforms into a garden of paradise, a temporary garden, or it will be a pit of hell. So the Quran does confirm that for the evildoers, for those who die in disbelief, for the unjust ones, the oppressors, the, the evil tyrant dictators, they will be punished in the grave. And we have many hadiths about that, my dear brothers and sisters. Numerous narrations about that. For instance, we have a narration about the squeezing of the grave. A person will be crushed and squeezed in the grave. This hadith is mentioned from the Prophet Muhammad When Sa'd ibn Ma'ad, uh, one of his uh, very noble companions, when he passed away, and he was a very decent companion, a very good companion. The Prophet he did something unprecedented with Sa'd. The companions were seen, the Prophet participated in his funeral. He took off his cloak to show respect. He walked barefoot. He even participated in burying him by taking the dust and the bricks to seal the grave. Now the Messenger of God doing that to one of the deceased is, is big, it's a big deal. Then the mother of Sa'd, she came and she told him, my dear son, you're definitely going to heaven. The Prophet told her, oh the mother of Sa'd, yeah sure you know he's a good companion, he was a very decent companion, he, he was a top believer, but do not impose on Allah to take him to heaven by saying, I know his fate 100%. Just right now, Sa'd was squeezed in the grave. That means he experienced some discomfort and punishment. The companions were shocked. They came to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Rasulullah, what, what, what's going on? Sa'd is a decent man. He's a very good person. His prayer, his fasting, him defending Islam. Why? Why did God squeeze him in the grave? The Prophet said because he had a bad attitude with his family at home. Yes, he was a good person, no doubt. But he had a bad attitude, bad akhlaq at home with his spouse, maybe with other family members. And this tells us, my dear brothers and sisters, how akhlaq are important. When you humiliate someone, when you attack someone, when you're abusive with your partner, when you engage in character assassination, you have a bad attitude at home with your parents, with your siblings, with your children, with your spouse, this has an effect if you don't fully repent from that. And Sa'd probably had forgotten to repent from that. Maybe he didn't repent from that. Had he repented, of course, Allah would have protected him. But Sa'd did not repent from that. So he had to experience some sort of punishment in the grave. Look at the power, the power of your akhlaq. The more positive your attitude is, the more pleasant your akhlaq is, the more you have a pleasant experience after you pass away. And the heaviest deed on the day of judgment that will be put on your scale is your akhlaq. So that's the squeeze of the grave. And we ask Allah to protect us from the squeeze of the grave. And the adab al-qabr, the punishment of the grave. Al -imam, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt talked about the punishment of the grave. In one hadith, the Imam salam says, a person was punished in his grave by the angels. And he asked, why do you punish me? They told him, because there was an oppressed person who was weak, he couldn't defend himself. You passed by, you could have helped that oppressed person and you did not. That's why we're punishing you. Because you abandoned a very important responsibility and obligation. My dear brothers and sisters, if you see someone oppressed, whether it's in your family, oftentimes there's a family member who gets bullied. Others take away this person's rights. Stand up to that person. Don't say, I don't want to get involved, خلاص, it's no big deal. If someone's being violated, someone's being oppressed and you know about it, you have to do something. Because if there's collective pressure, the oppressor stops. You know what encourages the oppressor? Because he knows he can get away with it. Because I know others won't get involved. But if I know every time I 
commit an act of injustice in my family, with my friends, somebody's going to stop me or somebody's going to put pressure on me, I will be discouraged because it won't be convenient for me. People oppress because it's convenient for them to oppress. And today, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the crises that we're experiencing in America is police brutality or racism, institutional racism against people of color, specifically blacks. Don't say it's none of my business. Say something, do something. The least that you can do is condemn it. You have a Facebook page, you have an Instagram page, you have Twitter, whatever you have, at least condemn it and mean it. Condemn racism, say it's unacceptable. If you're out there somewhere in the office, uh, somewhere else in society and you see a person of color being marginalized, being oppressed, do something. The hadith says one of the reasons why some people are punished in the grave is because they did not help the oppressed. There will be consequences. And if I've been neglectful in the past, Allah will forgive us, my dear brothers and sisters. Remember that the punishment in the grave is for those who did not repent from particular sins. If you've truly repented and now you are upholding the truth, Allah will save you. There will be inshallah no punishment for you. But, but this is serious. This part in the grave, this stage in the grave is serious. What are some a'mal we can do to protect us from the punishment of the grave? We have hadiths that tell us, this hadith is from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. He says the one who recites Surah An-Nisa, which is the fourth chapter in the Quran, every Friday Allah will protect him from the squeeze of the grave. Read that every Friday. The one who recites Surah Al-Zukhruf frequently, Allah will protect him from the punishment of the grave. The one who recites Surat Al-Qalam, Noon Wal-Qalam Wa Ma Yasturun. In your Salah, whether it's a Wajib Salah or a Mustahab Salah, try to memorize it if you can. If not, you can just read it from your phone. Let's say you're uh, praying the Nafila prayer, have the phone in front of you and recite it. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will protect you from the squeeze of the grave. Salat Al-Layl. My dear brothers and sisters, Al-Imam Al-Radha in a beautiful hadith about the night prayer. He states, Alaykum bi salat al-layl. You should pray salat al-layl. Fama min abdin yaqumu akhir al-layl. Any servant of Allah who gets up towards the end of the night and he prays eight rak'ah and then two rak'ah shaf and then the watr and then he says, Astaghfirullah wa atubu alayh 70 times. Allah, any person who does that, Allah will protect him from the squeeze of the grave, from the punishment of the grave, and from the fire of hell. And Allah will prolong his life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase his rizq. So my dear brothers and sisters, the more you uphold the night prayer, the more light and comfort it will give you in the grave. One of the acts that also help with the punishment of the grave is reciting this dua. I will recite it and translate it for you. Recite this dua every day, my dear brothers and sisters. For any difficulty in life, any concerning matter, my resort, my weapon is La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. Imagine if you say this every day and you mean it. Everything in life becomes easy for you to deal with. You will not collapse, you will not give hope, give up hope. You will not lose hope. For every difficulty, I have Allah, there's no God but Allah. masha'Allah. For every distress, sorrow, depression, I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. alhamdulillah. And for every blessing, I praise Allah and I thank Allah. وَلِكُلِّ رَخَائِنْ الشُّكْرُ لِلَّهِ I, I'm grateful to Allah for the blessings that He's given me, for the comfort that I have, the economic comfort that I have, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِكُلِّ أُعْجُوبَةٍ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ When there is something wondrous, something unusual, 
something strange that happens, I say Subhanallah. Or something that amazes me when I look at the creation of Allah, I say Glory be to Allah, Subhanallah. وَلِكُلِّ ذَنْبٍ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ And for every sin that I've committed, Astaghfir Allah, oh Allah forgive me. وَلِكُلِّ مُصِيبَةٍ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ For every tragedy, I don't lose hope and I don't give up and I'm angry. I say no, to Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. وَلِكُلِّ ضِيقٍ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ And for every difficulty, if I'm stuck in a situation, I say Allah is sufficient for me. وَلِكُلِّ قَضَاءٍ وَقَدَرٍ تَوَكَّلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ And I have full reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know that He is my guide, He is my inspiration. وَلِكُلِّ عَدُوٍ اَعْتَصَمْتُ بِاللَّهِ And when I am faced with an enemy, there's someone bothering me in my life. I have Allah as my guardian, as my protector. وَلِكُلِّ طَاعَةٍ وَمَعْصِيَةٍ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ Recite this dua, my dear brothers and sisters. The Imam says if you recite it 10 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from the punishment of the grave. And this hadith is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So the source of this dua is the Prophet. Jibra'il taught him this dua to teach us. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah protect you from the punishment of the grave. Don't allow this discussion to make you lose hope, to scare you from death and from the grave. Remember, if you're prepared, and inshallah you are prepared, you have goodness in your heart, Allah will transform your grave into a beautiful paradise. In our next discussion, we will examine the barzakh and what to expect in the barzakh. This is just the stage of the grave. There are stages after the grave before the day of judgment. It's just like graduation. You look forward to your graduation because you're prepared and you can be prepared. You have goodness in your heart. You don't reject the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're trying to be a good person. Even if you commit a sin, you feel bothered by it. The hadith says if you feel bothered by your sin, it means you're a believer because you care. Some people, they sin, they don't care. They're negligent. They don't care the least. That's a bad sign. But if you care, you're bothered by it, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting your repentance. That means you still love Allah and Allah loves you back. And Allah loves His creation. Wassalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa